Okay, so now we'll call the first speaker, Doru, if you could come in. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Doro Francesco. I'm the director of an organization called Vote Watch Europe, which does just that, watches the votes that are cast at European level. More precisely, we look at how the members of the European Parliament vote in the Parliament and how the member states' governments vote in the Council, and we make a lot of analysis on that, basically knowing who is in favor of what among the political families, in, in among the various uh, nationalities that cast their votes in the Council and, uh, and the Parliament. So I was invited to speak tonight to you and tell you uh, something from our experience uh, in relation to, to Brexit and the topic of the presentation that I thought it would be useful for the audience tonight is uh, how would the EU policy, policies look without uh, the UK? In order to do that, we did a simple um, exercise. We basically subtracted the position of the British representatives in the Council and in the Parliament from the decisions that were made there, and we would look to see what those decisions uh, had been uh, if the uh, UK was not there, so if we had an EU 27. Of course, this is more or less uh, an approximation, but uh, just for the, for the sake of the exercise, we thought to, to add to the debate because uh, you see, the debate so far is more on uh, what uh, the UK would look like outside the EU. We thought to look at this debate from a different angle. What would the EU look like without uh, Britain? Ah, I also have the... Okay. <laughs> All right. Just a point of information uh, for you. <laughs> this is how, uh, how the political groups are or how the balance of power is distributed among the political groups in the European Parliament with or and without the British members. So you see those pillars show each of the political groups aligned from the left. The GUNGL means the far right or the communist groups, and then you have the Greens, Socialists, the Liberal, ALDE group, European People's Party, Conservative and Reformists, further EFDD, the Eurosceptics of Nigel Farage, DNF, uh, anti-Europeans of Marine Le Pen, and then the non-attached further to the right. So the main point here is that uh, without the British MEPs, uh, the Socialist group will lose 20 members of the European Parliament on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, uh, the groups at the center right, so the Conservative will lose more. So the Conservative and Reformists, those, that group called the ECR, where David Cameron's British Conservatives are, will lose uh, 21 uh, members. And further to the right, the uh, Eurosceptics, the, free, the pro free market Eurosceptics of Nigel Farage uh, would go out, obviously, leaving, uh, uh, taking with it uh, 22 MEPs. The bottom line of this is that without the British MEPs, uh, the balance of power in the European Parliament would shift to the left, substantially. Not only that uh, the, the center right would lose a number of uh, seats, but also because from among the leftist, from among the socialists, the British Labour are the most pro-free market, so the least leftist. And I'm going to show you one example. <clears throat> effect, the effect number one of uh, the UK exiting the EU would be that the EU policies uh, would go more in the direction of adding more regulatory burden on the EU businesses uh, or uh, to, to add more red tape or maybe not necessarily to add it, but certainly not cut it, the, the existent one. And to showcase that, uh, I've chosen uh, a vote which is from this term. Um, it's actually from May this year. Uh, the vote was whether to cut uh, the red tape for European businesses or not. Those group at the right, you see those uh, pillars, the, the green pillars going up. That means that the center right meaning ALDE, so Liberals, EPP, People's Party, and Conservative and Reformists, they voted in favor of cutting red tape. Those group at the left, as you would expect, they, favor, they voted against cutting uh, the red tape for businesses. And uh, you see a clear ideological split. Uh, the nationality didn't matter that much. So it was, regardless of the country that they come from, members of the parliament voted according to their ideology, not so much according to their nationality, with one exception the British. So you see there in the SND group, which is the socialist, you see a little bit of green, 
Uh, that is because the British have deviated. And you see further to the right, that's the position of the British Labour delegation among the socialist group. Almost the entire socialist group voting against cutting red tape. The only exception was the British uh, Labour, which uh, showcases what I've just said, that uh, among the socialists, they are the most pro-free market oriented or the least regulatory oriented group. Right, so the screen doesn't show uh, properly uh, the, the text, but um, uh, the other effects of, uh, the, of Brexit would be that there would be less support for uh, nuclear energy in the European Parliament, so um, that doesn't help. <laughs> So, uh, British MEPs are among those who support the continuation of nuclear energy. As you may know, there is this debate of whether nuclear energy should be phased out or not. Uh, the same goes for unconventional sources of energy. Uh, British MEPs, with the exit of the British representatives, um, those who militate for phasing out uh, unconventional sources of energy, such as uh, exploitation of shell gas, would lose uh, power. And there will be stronger pressure for binding EU environmental targets. As you may know, there is this debate whether the EU should impose its own environmental targets or wait for an agreement at a global level. It, that would make a, a good subject for one of your other debates, uh, perhaps, uh, because it's quite balanced between the left and the right. With the British representatives exiting, there would be stronger pressure for binding uh, targets at EU level. According to the same logic, intellectual property rights would be uh, less protected. And the EU budget, uh, as you may obviously assume, would be smaller because the UK contribution would no longer be there. But the second effect would be that uh, the, the contribution of the remaining member states would increase. Why would they increase? Not only to compensate for the losses, but also because there would be less opposition to having a strong EU budget. So the Commission and the Parliament, who traditionally fight for a stronger, for a bigger EU budget so that the EU has more money at its disposal to implement its policies, would lose, lose an adversary in, in the uh, personification of the British representative. So they would find it easier to ask for more money for the EU. And uh, there will be a stronger push for tax harmonization and higher taxation in general and higher taxation of financial transactions in particular because the British representatives are the main ones that oppose uh, such taxation. So without them, uh, the push for tax harmonization would uh, find a better uh, environment to develop. Lastly, we found in our analysis no immediate and clear substantial effects of the Brexit on EU policy regarding uh, opening up of international trade. So, so far, with or without uh, the UK, uh, we don't think that the EU uh, trade policy would change that much, nor uh, the cyber security or the data protection regulation would uh, be affected substantially. Which concludes my presentation. I hope you find it uh, somewhat interesting, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. So do you have any questions for Doru on what uh, he just said? No? Yes? No, at the same time, just one by <laughs> one. By one. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Doro. Thank, thank you very much. I very much encourage you to visit our website uh, and uh, ask your questions there if you want. Thank you. So now, the second speaker, thank you very much. Greetings, you are, you are fantastic. Uh, you, sir, where, where, where is he? You, sir, should go in politics. Uh, it's clear you will be elected. Uh, good move also with the glasses, you know, when you are on stage. I mean, st style matters in a debate. Style matters. So, I mean, you have to captivate the audience. You, the two teams have, have done that. You had good arguments. Uh, but you need, uh, it's important to engage people, right, to talk to them, especially in a debate like this.
This is going to be a debate which is going to be complicated for both sides. And I would, I would, and I'll come back to what you said, by the way, which is what I've been asked <laughs> to do. But uh, first of all, before going there, this is going to be a tough debate because on one end you will have a number, and, I, and I'm not taking sides right now. I'm, I, it's my person, it's me only speaking, and I'll talk on behalf of the chamber. You will have people who will say, "Yeah, we need to get out because what you said," which are you know interesting arguments, rather simple arguments. On the other hand, you will have other people who will try to justify staying in using more technical arguments, economical arguments, social arguments, which are just more difficult to package. And to, in, in those type of debates, you, you have to be sexy. You have to be sexy. Not in a sexy sense, in an interesting sense. Um, and that's why the glasses thing is important. Uh, and in particular, in the UK, and I, and I talked to my British friends in, in, in the audience, the press, the media, is very good at you know, going after one issue in a way that captivates the, the, the readership and influences the election. So it's up, and now I put back my, my hat of the British chamber, it's up to the yes camp to also come with those type of... of strategies to make the pro-arguments, the, the, the stay-in arguments, interesting and that they resonate with people. So that's, that's to start. A couple of things that struck me. Um, yeah, EU failure. Okay. I mean, at the chamber we say, oh yeah, absolutely, the EU is not perfect at all. We all know that. But failure is a big word. And what does, that, what does failure mean? Failure to, to what? To address... We are still at peace, 50, 60 years now in a row, which is pretty amazing for Europe, that's one. Uh, 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 two, uh, uh, I know you, know, you laugh, but uh, you know, my family, my parents, they remember the war, and, uh, well, they, they kind of remember, <laughs> they're old now. Uh, anyway, uh, when they are lucid, they remember the war. What about that? And um, Yeah, I know, that's funny, but that's sad, believe me. Um, anyway, so EU failure, that's, yeah, that's one point, but what does, I mean, how do you characterize failure? I mean, it's failure to do what? Like to protect us from a global economic crisis? I think actually the EU protected us pretty well from the consequences of the crisis. If you look at the, the global cataclysm that, that actually ha happened. So in your debate next time, characterize what failure is if you engage into a debate like this. You have to say what it is. What, what does failure for you might, 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 might mean something, might mean something else for you. So you have to characterize it. Migration. You both talk, both sides talk about migration. Very interesting. Actually, I'm afraid you were both wrong. <laughs> in the sense that if you look at the debate in the UK, the, sorry, the government talks about migration of EU citizens that benefit from the social system in the UK. You're not talking about the Syrians and those poor people who are stuck in Calais. Actually, the borders of the UK are very well protected because those people are in France and they, they want to go to the UK and they, I don't know, 15,000 people in Calais. So actually the UK has right now has a pretty good situation. What they don't want, and that's next time you, you need to qualify that as well, what they don't want is people from other EU countries let's say like Poland, for instance, uh, just to name one country, to benefit too much from the UK uh, social security system, pretty much. So migration, yes, it's an argument, but you will have to define it because it's not the same migration that we are talking about. It's not people from Syria, Northern Africa, or, 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 or Sub-Saharan Africa. It's talking about the EU migrants here. Uh, Swiss model, you both use the argument Swiss, Norway, Turkey. Great. But you actually... Those countries, okay, Swiss and Norway, because Turkey is really different. Uh, um, um, yes, they they contribute to the budget of the EU. They uh, implement the regulation that comes out of the EU, but they don't decide on them. And none of you mentioned that point, which is very important, which is they don't have a say. So uh, I've been uh, in Brussels for many years, seen many meetings, and interesting, I was recently talking to the ambassador from Norway, actually. He said to me, well, when there is a discussion on certain regulation, in, they leave the table. They leave, they, the ambassador retracts, leaves the room, so the other countries decide what they want to do, and then they call back the ambassador and say, hey, here it is. That's new, new regulation. Thank you very much. So, I mean, that's quite interesting, actually, because you, those countries, they pay up, they give money to the EU from their budget, um, but they don't decide. So, that's also an argument to, 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 put, uh, uh, to, uh, to put forward. So, and by the way, 
if you really want to go into that debate, Swiss and Norway are, are two very different countries from, from the UK. Uh, Norway, rich in oil and gas, so they have lots of money, lots of far, uh, fish farming, actually, there's lots of salmon, so it's a very wealthy country, small population. Um, uh, Swiss, uh, Switzerland, it's a global trading power, even if it's small, uh, huge financial services industry, luxury industry as well, uh, pharmaceutical industry. So you cannot compare those two countries. You, can, you just cannot. It, it's absolutely different for many reasons. Anyway, I understand why you use that example, but the key argument is that those countries pay up, implement the regulation, and they don't decide. I mean, I think from a citizen point of view, I would not like that, that my country, and, and, so we don't have a say in the process and we have all this regulation. So, Single market. Um, you, the Yes team mentioned the single market, absolutely. This is key for the UK industry. Big companies, small companies as well, they all benefit from the single market. So tomorrow morning, I'm going to give an example. Tomorrow morning, the UK leaves. Fine, great. Um, well, not fine, great, but let's say fine, great. Um, so the UK leaves. Um, you mentioned, or maybe the politician mentioned, uh, that actually it would not be a big deal to renegotiate those uh, different uh, agreements. Well, actually, no one knows. No one knows. But the risk is, the risk is that the reciprocity that the UK enjoys right now under the, the, the EU single market might not happen. And we have at the British Chamber companies who already start a plan B in case including moving the headquarters back to continental Europe because from a legal perspective it would be safer because I work for Walt Disney in my, my day job. Um, if the UK leaves, then uh, we have all, all of our hundreds of uh, Disney channels. Okay, you are too old to watch Disney channels now, but even I watch, actually. Um, don't throw stuff at me. I mean... <laughs> You, uh, you have the right to disagree, but don't be violent. That's all I'm asking. Um, anyway, so we are asking ourselves, okay, the, uh, the, the UK leave, we are under EU, uh, sorry, we are under a UK license to broadcast our channels. Well, if the UK leaves, so what is the legal certainty that we have to operate under this license? Should we go to Amsterdam or Paris or Brussels? Or, uh, so that's, that's the point about the next day. Actually, that, that's a bigger point that none of you made if I may say so. The point is, what happened the next morning of the vote? What does happen if the UK leave? The next morning, what has happened? In reality. And that's, to me, one of the biggest uh, uh, weakness of the no camp campaign so far. Is that, yes, you know, leaving because... And for reasons that I understand, you know, you want to retain your sovereignty, blah, 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 mm. you know, perceived or not. But the next morning, what happens? What do you do? Who decide? Uh, what about for companies, businesses, people? You all, all of you benefit from Europe. Uh, me included. Huh? You, well, you have those low-cost airlines, Ryanair, Wizz Air, and whatever, Air. Uh, that's a product from actually the regulation happening at the European level. When you use your mobile phone that I don't have with me, when you use, sorry, your mobile phone and you go to a different country, you have those roaming regulation that says, thanks to the EU, and I'm not saying the EU is, is perfect, it is not, uh, <laughs> far from it. But when you travel to another country and you use this wonderful, what kind of brand is that? <laughs> well, okay, this wonderful phone, you actually, you cannot pay too much because the EU set a cap on the price of roaming communication. So that's an actual advantage that the EU brings to all of us, and in particular to the younger generation that I'm not part of anymore. So I think that's an important uh, uh, thing. Uh, um, Euro, you, sir, I think, ask a uh, question about the Euro. Or maybe, yes. Um, so interesting, but indeed, I mean, it's not a condition. Uh, to, I mean, to join the EU, you don't have to join the euro. The euro is a product of an economic situation. You reach a threshold or you don't. If you don't qualify, even if you're a member, you will never join the euro because economically you, the euro board says, nah, sorry, you're not strong enough, big enough, whatever. So it's, it's, um, you can be obviously part of the EU without having a euro. It works. It works pretty well. That the UK, that the, 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 yeah, the, the UK wants to keep the pound, I think it makes a lot of sense because it's also a global exporter uh, and I don't see why the uh, UK should join the euro. They are doing pretty well like this. Um, financial services. I'm very surprised and none of the team used that example of financial services. The UK, London, is the hub for financial services in 
in, in, in Europe, with Frankfurt trying to you know, get hold of that, or Paris behind Frankfurt, actually. And, and that's a huge plus. That's a huge plus for the UK in terms of economic power, jobs, high-skilled jobs, well, very well-paid jobs, and a whole ecosystem that exists in London around financial services. Actually, the point from many our companies, uh, and not all, not all, from the financial services industry is that the, the, it's better for the UK to remain. Otherwise, the threat is that Frankfurt would actually become the hub in Europe for financial services and then would be the natural partner of Hong Kong and Singapore and other places. So important also to mention the, the, the place and the role of financial services in, in this. So that's what I take from your different uh, interventions. Um, I did take note, actually. Uh, 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 Patrick, you mentioned a fantastic point, which is indeed trade. Trade, yeah. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, we leave and then we will have trade deal with those countries. Well, actually, the U.S. just said no. <laughs> Sorry, you won't. Uh, Michael Froman, who is the U.S. chief trade negotiator, whatever, blah, 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 he just said the other day, he said, well, if the U.K. leaves and they ask us, us meaning the U.S., for bilateral trade agreements, the U.S. would say, sorry, no, we, we trade with the EU because it's bigger, it's a group, it's 28 countries, well, 27 <laughs> if the U.K. leaves. Uh, so, yes. But already U.K., the trade share with the U.S. is 13%, which is like double comparing to France, which is only 6%. And they have a whole history behind, you know, in trading U.K. and U.S. True. But today, the norm is that uh, the U.S. government is not interested anymore into bilateral trade agreements because it takes for political reasons. So in Congress right now, there is no zero appetite anymore to sign trade agreements between countries. What they want is Asia and the U.S., Europe and the U.S., I don't know, Middle East and the U.S., because it's just in one go you bring 10, 15, 25 countries. That's the way trade policy is evolving uh, uh, over the years. And the UK would, if the UK leaves, they would remain a privileged trade partner with the US. They would, absolutely. You're, you're right on that, but they would not get a special trade deal. That I can assure you because there is no appetite to spend political capital in the US to do that. So you, you see my point, right? It's, but again, I mean, uh, one of the reasons why we are, and I don't want to monopolize, sorry, the debate, but once I get a microphone, I cannot stop. Um, uh, yeah, one of the reasons why we, Walt Disney, were in London is that because the English language, great hub, uh, flights, proximity to Europe, it's our uh, aircraft carrier into Europe, the UK. But if the UK leaves, we will ask ourselves, should we have another aircraft carrier, another base, another hub into Europe? Most likely, yes. Um, Scotland was mentioned by the US campaign, which is a good point. Um, the, 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 the no team. You mentioned long-term economic benefits if the UK leaves. Great. But what are those? You did not qualify them. So I was expecting more details. So you, you may want, if you, you know, keep debating, you may want to, to drill down on those because that's important. You say, oh, long-term economic benefits. People are like, okay, like, and then you get shot. Sorry. One minute. Okay, well, um, yes, one point that was mentioned by the two teams, which is very important, is that the UK is indeed the most pro-business country in Europe. And here again, my hat with the chamber hat on, if we believe, if the UK leaves... That is going to, uh, and that's back to Radu's presentation, that is going to slow down the pace of economic reforms in Europe and probably make the Europe more cumbersome, uh, even more slow to adapt to global realities, while the UK is one, it probably is the country w which drives the rest of the EU towards a more pro-reform agenda, pro economic activity agenda and pro-growth agenda. With that, I'm afraid that I have to stop. And I would like to thank you, to thank uh, all everybody in the room here, especially you, for dragging me here tonight. Uh, and it was a great debate. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, thank you very much again for all of you who participated tonight and uh, hope to see you to the next one that will be on uh, um, Clément, what will be the next subject that we will debate? Climate change. climate change. So the next one will be on climate change. Okay, thank you very much.